You know, I wasn't originally sure what I was going to score this movie, and I had to think about it so much that I had to sleep on it. Insomnia stars Al Pacino as Will Dormer, a detective from LA who's sent to a small town in Alaska, along with his partner, played by Martin Donovan, to investigate a recent murder. Aided by a local detective, played by Hilary Swank, the case quickly becomes complicated when they cross paths with a local author, played by Robin Williams, and many of Dormer's past demons quickly catch up to him. Welcome back to my Christopher Nolan series. If you're new here, I'm going through each of Nolan's films and reviewing them one by one. This was originally supposed to coincide with the release of Tenet, but I I just found out that Tenant has now been released indefinitely. Oh well. I already covered two movies, I'm just gonna keep going to the end, and when I get the Tenant, I get the Tenant. I recently spoke about Nolan's first two movies, Following and Memento, and I'll leave links to those in case you missed them. But if you want to stay up to date with The Dark Knight, Inception, and everything else Nolan, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll catch them as soon as they're out. But right now, let's talk about Nolan's third movie, Insomnia. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say you probably haven't heard of this movie, am I right? Or if you have, have you seen it? I asked a few people before I sat down and watched this who knew Nolan, like his movies, love all the actors involved. I asked them if they've seen this and they never even heard of it. And that seems to be the general consensus when it comes to this movie. Either you haven't seen it or don't even know what it is altogether, unless you're just a big Nolan fan in general. Which is a little weird when you realize it was actually critically acclaimed and did fairly well at the box office. Another thing I hear specifically from people who have seen it is that it's a lesser Nolan movie. And you know something? That's honestly what I thought for a while as well. I saw this towards the end of high school, I had already seen The Dark Knight and Memento and The Prestige, and my reaction to it at the time was like, yeah, this was good. Nothing amazing, nothing bad, it was good. I never rewatched it after that though, until specifically sitting down to watch it for these reviews. And I'm kind of mad at myself for waiting this long because this is actually an excellent movie, and I'd argue it's better than a lot of the other Nolan movies you're familiar with. I guess the big thing with this is that of all of his movies, this is the least Nolan-like of them all. I mean, he still uses a lot of the same directing techniques. He reteams with cinematographer Wally Pfister and composer David Julian, so it had the look. It still maintained that dark, brooding feel that's present in all of his movies. But I think where a lot of people get this idea of it being an inferior movie, and probably even why I thought this originally too, was that it's the only Nolan movie where he doesn't have a writing credit. It was written by someone named Hilary Seitz, who had only one other credit to her name before this, and the only other film she wrote afterwards was Eagle Eye in 2008, which... I don't know there. I wish I had more to comment on as far as that goes, but I looked her up and there's close to nothing on her. She did some rewrites for a few other major movies and that's it. But this is actually a remake of a Norwegian film of the same name from 1997. Stellan Skarsgård actually played the original role that Al Pacino plays here. I haven't seen it, but it's supposed to be very good. So what all this adds up to is probably the most straightforward Nolan movie out there. Not that it's one dimensional, but unlike all of Nolan's other movies where there are crazy plot twists, settings that are totally out there, or any other little hidden secrets, this is simply a grounded psychological crime thriller. No catch, no nonlinear storytelling, no major surprises. Well, actually, the marketing downplayed Robin Williams' involvement, and we'll get more to him in a moment, but other than that, that was it. So in a way, this isn't so much Nolan's movie in the way that he's not as deeply involved as he normally is. It's kind of funny, he goes from one extreme to the other. In Following, he did nearly everything. Writing, directing, cinematography, editing, and here he's just a director. But while the plot doesn't sound as inherently intriguing as his other movies, it's definitely not by the numbers. There is still so much more to it, and it is honestly just a phenomenal movie. It's less of a murder mystery, like they don't hold out till the end of the movie to do this big reveal as far as who the killer is, you find that out earlier than you'd expect, and it's actually more of a cat and mouse as far as that goes. But even then, I wouldn't exactly call the murder the focal point of the movie. Like, it is, but it isn't. Really, this is more of a character study with this murder investigation being something that plays into said character study. This touches on themes of corruption, guilt, accountability, and how far will you go to maintain your image. It asks 
facts if you're willing to risk your integrity to keep a certain look. So Al Pacino, when this starts off, as he's in Alaska, he's also being investigated by Internal Affairs back in LA for some questionable evidence he had in some previous cases. And it's especially hanging over his head because they're planning on using Martin Donovan, who plays his partner, to testify against them, which he reveals to him within the first few minutes, which I don't know if it was the smartest move there, but he rationalizes it as he's not giving them much, so it'll be nothing to really ruin Al Pacino. But as you'd expect, this doesn't sit well with him, and as they're working on this case together, you can feel the tension mounting between them. It's moments like that where Nolan's direction comes heavily into play, because he captures so perfectly just how uncomfortable this is. Even when they're trying to just have a casual conversation, he films a lot of it in close-ups, and you hear David Julian's score just give it this brooding feel. There's this sense that Pacino feels trapped. He knows they solved this murder together, only for Donovan to go against him once they get back home. And no one gets down just how big of a predicament this is and the serious implications it will have on Pacino. He keeps making jabs at Martin Donovan, and there's this one really great scene where Martin Donovan is trying to tell him, oh, you know, it's not as bad as you think it will be, and Pacino just snaps at him. He's just like, what do you care? You can just, like, cut the tension in the room with a knife. Like, it's just so mad masterfully done. So let's talk about Al Pacino for a second. This is by far his most overlooked performance. And what's funny about that is up until last year, this was his last really great performance. Because after this, we get him in movies like Geely and Jack and Jill. It was movies like those two that made up most of his career after this movie. I don't know there. But what makes this such a great performance is that just like how this is the least Nolan-like movie, this is also the least Al Pacino-like performance. After Scarface, his old gimmick for a while was ranting, raving, saying things like hoo and whatever other little things he can come up with, or should I say what the filmmakers can come up with for him. But this is a much more nuanced performance from him. I wouldn't call it restrained, but it's just without a lot of the over-the-top yelling and screaming he normally does. He he trades that in for a more grounded but intense performance. And when I say intense, I mean intense. There's a great scene when he's at the front desk of the hotel he's staying at and he's on the phone with someone back in LA and they're arguing about the pending investigation and he's just laying into this guy but he's just so bitter. But without going into that full-on Pacino ranting and I was almost like holding my breath while watching this. He just gets so into it and it is stunning. When I was watching this before doing this review there were a couple of times I would just go to myself like oh my god Al Pacino is just so good and that was one of those moments and then it's followed by a scene of him pouring his heart out to the hotel owner who's played by Maura Tierney and he reflects on the mistakes he's made in the past and how he feels about it and seeing him just switch gears like that just so seamlessly from bitter to reflective just shows how masterful of an actor he truly is though I will say of all the protagonists in a Nolan film Will Dormer has by far some of the most unlikable qualities like he's someone who when you first meet him you want to root for him but as as events unfold and we see how he handles parts of the investigation and how far he's willing to go to get what he wants, you take a step back from that because you're like, mm, I don't really agree with what you just did there. But you find yourself in this weird rock and a hard place at times because the end doesn't justify his means, so you definitely don't like certain decisions he makes, but he also acknowledges that and wrestles with it, as does the audience. Not that we're giving him a pass, but we just understand even though we don't like what he's doing, we get where he's coming from in a way, and we're interested to see if he's going to overcome that internal struggle. And Pacino's performance makes it all the more captivating. And this arc is intertwined with Hilary Swank as the main local detective involved in all this. She's Pacino's go-to person during the investigation and she idolizes him and he's a really well-known detective and she has nothing but respect for his work. She read a lot about him beforehand and she ushers him around and she follows his lead on everything and like he is her hero. I actually really enjoyed their dynamic. It's a slightly familiar feeling like she's young and has a very romanticized view of his work while he's a little more seasoned and has a more cynical mindset but they still both respect one another and he still enjoys talking to her as much as she enjoys talking to him so they somehow oddly mesh well together and Hilary Swank just does a great job 
Like, this is a very underrated performance by her. But a major arc is that as more is revealed about Pacino, she slowly starts coming to grips that he may not be as great of a guy as she thinks he is. And I mean slowly. This was like one of my only major complaints, and it's not even really that big of a complaint. But towards the middle, there is like a long stretch where she'll be off screen for a bit, and then she'll sporadically pop back in and ask Pacino some questions and take like everything he says at his word and then walks out. It wasn't like a huge deal for me, like I get it's how the character's kinda supposed to be. She still sees him as this big hero type, but her character development just stalls slightly and we don't really see her arc play out until the very end. It didn't ruin anything for me, but that's really my only major complaint, really. The film also captures Pacino's deteriorating mental state as his world becomes undone. That's where the title of the movie comes in, it's always bright out in this town, and as everything's starting to unravel for Pacino, he can't get any sleep. There's an event that happens early on in the movie that keeps bothering him, and he starts to question if things played out the way he thought they did. And that lack of sleep ties into his constant questioning himself. And the aesthetic in capturing that was great. This is where things like the score, the cinematography, and Nolan's direction come heavily into play. We'll get extreme close-ups, and Pacino will have very quick flashes of previous events that are haunting him, and it's got this chilling score and it is just unsettling. Wally Pfister's cinematography in particular was excellent with the scenes showing just Pacino unable to sleep but another moment where it really stood out and it was just phenomenal was early on when the detectives go on their first hunt for the killer and it leads them to the woods and it's foggy out and you see it essentially from Pacino's point of view. You as well as Pacino only have a clear vision of some trees that are right in front of you and then there will be people who are like way further out ahead of them and you don't get a clear shot of what they look like. And it is both eerie and disorienting. It is by far the best shot scene in the entire movie. But let's talk about what was at the time the most shocking part of the movie. Robin Williams. His performance is top notch. 2002 was a great year for him actually because even though we knew he could be in serious roles like before this he was in Good Will Hunting and Dead Poets Society but the light-hearted comedian we all love would still pop out from time to time in those roles like he was still charming and he'd still make little jokes here and there but this was the same year that One Hour Photo came out and that was another role where he was just this really creepy dude and audiences were dumbfounded at the time. He was never someone who was totally unsympathetic before and it's like not only does he show he can expand his range but he crushes it too. I think what makes him work so well here is that it still sounds so much like the Robin Williams we're used to and by that I mean is he's this guy who's super manipulative and he thinks he and Pacino are a lot more closely linked than they really are so he tries to give this reasoning to him that he's really like a good guy and he's the victim but when he starts talking about things that he does it's horrifying but he says it in that oddly comforting Robin Williams way that we're used to hearing. Like imagine if the characters from Goodwill Hunting or Dead Poet Society in those very comforting ways of speaking just says this awful vile stuff. And when I say that, I'm not saying that his delivery doesn't fit how the character is. It's the fact that this guy is trying to normalize some truly terrible things and he says it so calmly and then tries to manipulate Pacino into going along with it. It just makes him super creepy. Like I never thought I'd say Robin Williams was creepy in a movie, but here we are. He never topped this, by the way. He had some good movies after this, but this and One Hour Photo showed how much range he truly had, and we never got to see it replicated. I'm glad Nolan really brought out how talented of a guy he truly was. If you haven't seen this yet, you are really missing out. While it may not have all the characteristics of your typical Christopher Nolan movie, this shows that Nolan can take anything, even with a movie that has the most straightforward sounding plot, and turn it into gold. His directing really brings out the overall intensity. Plus, the cinematography's top notch, the themes about corruption and morality are conveyed well, it's got a highly engaging story, and it's got some overlooked performances that show Al Pacino and Robin Williams truly giving it their all. This is incredibly underrated and it's the best Christopher Nolan movie you haven't seen. Insomnia gets a 9 out of 10. So up next in the Nolan chronology we finally reach Batman territory starting with Batman Begins. So stay tuned for that. Same bat time, same bat channel.
Well, actually, it'll be released later in the week, so not the same time. Anyway, so let me know, did you see Insomnia, or are you planning to see it, and what were your thoughts? Did you enjoy the performances, did you like the story, and would you like to see Christopher Nolan do another movie like this? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it, and for more movie reviews and film discussion, please make sure to hit that subscribe button to stay updated. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll catch you next time.